Kenny Taro on iHeartRadio, actor, comedian, Stephen Wright. Plus, let's put in consulting producer on FX's Louie, and he's out on the road. Cruising into Charlotte Friday, October 9th to perform at McGlowan Theater. Following night, Saturday, October 10th, he'll be in Durham at Carolina Theater. We are unplugged and totally uncut with Stephen Wright. The theater you're about to perform in is the McGlowan Theater. It is so up close, personal, extremely intimate. Is that the current Stephen Wright tour, to be that close to the fans? Well, you know, the theaters are all different sizes that I, that I play. Uh, I like anything from like 500 to like 1,500 seats. So I don't even know how many seats that is, but I heard it's a nice place, though. Oh, it's beautiful because it's just gets you, it puts you right in there, and people can really just kind of dig into your your thinking and your visual up on that stage. Where did that? Vis- oh, good. Where did that visual come from? Where? Because I mean, were you just sitting around one day and said, "I'm going to try this view"? When I was 16, I started watching Johnny Carson the Tonight Show, and I really became uh, obsessed with him in that show. I started watching it as many nights as I could. I loved him and I loved the comedians he had on there like Richard Pryor and Robert Klein and George Carlin and David Brenner and uh, all these people, you know, some of them I never saw again, but when I saw them doing stand-up on this show, I thought that's what I would really like to do, be one of these guys who comes out and talks for five minutes about stuff they made up about life. And so it, it, it got in my head pretty early on. So it was almost like that was your musical instrument where Eric Clapton picked up the guitar, you picked up life. Yeah, I picked up the, watching The Tonight Show, yes. A lot and of- then there was a radio oh, there was a radio show in Boston that played two comedy albums every Sunday night around nine o'clock same age 15 16 17 and I'd be in bed with my radio Sunday night and I heard all these albums and I I just love stand-up I think I was studying it without knowing it just because I was so passionate about it. I've heard so many people from the Boston area talk about how you would go in there and into different comedy clubs and just practice and practice and practice. You were endless in fine-tuning your art. Yeah, I was lucky that I started in 79 and then like in 80, the comedy club boom happened. Like there were so many clubs in Boston and there were places you could do comedy that would just have it one night a week, like a restaurant or something. It wasn't even an actual comedy club. So there were many, many stages around and you could, you know, the more you went on, you learned how to do it more. I wasn't the only one doing it all the time. There were, we had a great opportunity to go on. As, we would go on sometimes three times in one night, three different clubs on a weekend. When you when you finally made it to the Tonight Show, was it everything you wanted it to be, or was it? Is it? Did it just say, "Look, I'll give me another chance. I'll come back next time." It it it, it was uh, it was very surreal because I was twenty six. And there I was on the thing that I wanted to be on my whole life. And uh, it was incredible. I got so nervous that I wasn't nervous anymore. I kind of was like numb. I was numb because it was too much to handle. And I heard Johnny Carson laughing at what I was saying when I was standing there doing the material. And then he called me over and I sat down. And then that was on a Friday. Then I went on the next Thursday, too. And then so... Everything He changed my life twice because of watching his show made me want to be a comedian. And then when I went on the show, you know, I got everything changed career wise. So I owe my ton of my life to that him and that show. At any time, did he ever lean across that desk and say, it's time for you to grow in your shows as well? In other words, I mean, because look what you're doing with Louie right now on FX. It, th- that had to have been planted somewhere along the way for you to be so open minded. Well, I I had been offered to do a show, my own, like, sitcom, like, in the, during the 80s there, and I didn't want to do it, actually, because uh, I'm more of a loner type guy. I just wanted to do the stand up and wander around the country and other countries, too. I, I perform in other countries, too. I didn't want, like, 
the, the uh, whole like show revolving around me. It just didn't feel right to me. But so then years later, I mean, Louis asked me to be involved in his show as like a, a sounding board. Like he tells me the scripts. He, I go to the shooting. I look at the editing. So that's different. It's not, you know, I'm mean, like Louis has a band and I get to sit in with his band. Louis is absolutely brilliant and I'm very happy to be working with him. The two of you together is just priceless television. I would love to see some outtakes of the two of you just hanging. <laughs> we have a good time. Do you, do you ever look back at, at, at Twitter and think that they stole your idea? Because you are the master of 140 characters delivering us to a great laugh. And Twitter comes along and basically steals your idea. Well, I didn't invent uh, writing a one-liner. And uh, so I, I, I know that... Uh, it is like that, but that's just, you know, how it is. In fact, I don't put jokes on Twitter because to me, I mean, if people tell me your style is perfect, you're the one-liner guy. Uh, to me, a, a joke is something to be performed in front of a live audience, not to be just read. But anyway, no, I don't feel like they stole my idea. Speaking of reading things, is it fun still to read your audience when you get out there and kind of dip into it on the on the first lines and then figure out who they are? Well, the audience is like, a, even though there are a lot of people, they have one distinct personality. Every night they have like a their own vibe, their own energy, their own like kind of a slightly different attitude. And you can tell within a, like not the first line, but in a couple of minutes, you can feel what it is. And then depending on what it is, you can adjust to it. It's kind of like surfing, like even though I've never surfed. <laughs> it's like the audience is like a, as the water, the movement of the waves, the movement of the water, and then you, you adjust to it. So when they make that Stephen Wright movie, do you ask Johnny Depp to play you? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh... By the way, he was. I think he should be nominated for an Academy Award. I don't know if you saw that movie. I he, did see it. Isn't he amazing? Th this is his year. This is the. This is it, the year. It is. I mean, I after about a half an hour, I kept forgetting as the movie went on. I was. I kept. Oh yeah, that's Johnny Depp. <laughs> I forgot that it was even Johnny Depp. That's an excellent movie. I don't know who would play me. Maybe I don't know. Maybe in Dorothy Hamill. <laughs> <laughs> For reasons I don't want to go into. I mean. <laughs> when when you're writing, are you are you writing with that audience in mind, or are you trying to get yourself to giggle first? I just think of things that I think are funny. I don't think, and then I hope that they agree. I don't try to like you know tailor it to them I just think of things that, that make me laugh and so then I have to try it out on them and I have no idea I've been doing this so many years I still if I think it's funny then I write it down but I have to test it out on them and for every four jokes I write only one of them gets enough of a laugh to stay in my act so when they don't laugh at it if they don't laugh at it three nights in a row, they'll never laugh at it. And if they laugh at it three nights in a row, then I know that I can count on it. But if they don't laugh, I, I don't think that it wasn't funny. I just think they didn't agree with me. And they're, they're in charge. They're, they're like, the, the audience is like a bunch of editors, except they don't know they're the editors. <laughs> it's, it's almost like you've hired the audience to make sure that your joke is done right. <laughs> yes, that's true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Being out on that stage even today and going behind the scenes, are you going to start growing a little bit more toward the sitcom era? And, and get, Because now that it's opened up on Hulu and we've also got Netflix that's got some shows going, your imagination has to have a TV show. Well, I, it's been brought up to me again, and uh, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do. I have something in my mind about it, but I don't know if it'll ever... Uh be actually made into something. I don't know. I don't. I don't know what I'm going to do with that. But the opportunity is there. Yes. 
Is it still about getting that big rush, that that rush of audience, that laughter that you can hear in the echo in the room? I'll tell you, that stage is a different place than anywhere I've ever been. I mean, when the it's that cliche you hear about the energy coming from the audience. When you walk out onto that, it's just different. Everything is like electric. Everything's magnified, and it's it, there's a tension. There's it's like walking a tightrope. And it's a very unique thing to like then be have that. Even if you didn't do anything, even if you just stood there, you can feel that it's different. And then, and then you're communicating these thoughts and these concepts you've come up with, and they're laughing or not laughing. It's a very electric, exciting situation. It can, it can't get, it never gets old. It can't get old. It's too exciting. Is there a favorite theater that you always like going back to? No. <laughs> was that a quick enough answer? That was that, that was so Stephen Wright. That was <laughs> I, I got to tell you, I had a program director tell me one time, he goes, you need to go study Stephen Wright. He knows if he could be a radio star, he would be the biggest thing on those two speakers because the man knows how to deliver a thought. Oh, that's nice. That's a nice compliment. Yeah, I just try to get it. One thing I do is is to get to the point. You know, the jokes have the fewest amount of words that can just get to the point. And I don't want to be taught. I want them to be la- I don't want to be standing there without them laughing. That's why the jokes are so short. Well, I'm, I, I got to ask you then, is the laughter the addiction or is it the writing? It's the whole thing, really. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a, being a stand-up, you're a writer and a performer, and both of the things are, they combine together to be this unique experience. But if I had to choose one, like Sophie's Choice, <laughs> I would choose the writing. How how have you disciplined? Because your- writing is thinking. I mean, I'm thinking. Exactly. I'm only on the stage 85 minutes, but I'm thinking all the time. Well, it's, it's almost like you're the original social media then. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's thinking all the time. It's just that some of my stuff is insane. I get paid for being insane. It's quite good. But that that insanity is so simple. You, you would have to be insane to be able to keep that kind of discipline in your life. Well, it's just from noticing stuff. Uh, all artists are just uh, bouncing off the, you know, re- reacting to the world just by noticing things. And I drew, you would draw and paint since elementary school for years and years and years before. I never even wrote a joke till I was 23 years old. So the, but the drawing, I would try to draw it as realistically as possible. And when you do that, you really notice the details and things that you wouldn't know notice if you weren't drawing or doing a painting and I think uh, that exercise my part of my mind of observing and then later that carried over to when I would write things because writing is based on observing do you have a favorite writing instrument I mean if you're going to go that language with writing which is my passion do you have a favorite writing instrument that you keep with you well, now I have the you know the iPhone, and I write in the in the note section of the uh, phone. But for years, I would write, and I would buy drawing little sketch books for drawing. They have no lines on them, and I would write on the on the in, on the paper in the drawing book. Lines on the paper piss me off. The lines have the lines ruined the paper. It's like I want to bring it back to look at this. Somebody or a machine or something drew all over the paper. Give me another one. That's so true. Like buying a used diary. <laughs> Will there ever come a time where you take all of that writing, all of that history, and do what David Letterman did and just throw it all away? I don't know. I, I don't know. Um... Uh, you see, what he did is so different. It's so much more intense than what I do to do that show for that many years. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm more of a, um, I don't know, because I like to think, I like to show up in some theaters and do it. So I can't see not doing it. I mean, of course, I will stop at some point, but 
I enjoy it too much. Well, you're you're brilliant at it. You're going to be at McGlowan Theater in Charlotte, October 9th. October 10th, you're going to be at Carolina Theater, which is in Durham. And we look forward to seeing you continuously grow with FX's Louie, dude. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you you so much. much. Thank you for everything that you've done. You're welcome. Good talking to you. 